checking one, two, one, two. Uh, good morning, Crosspoint, and the extensions of Crosspoint across the globe, those that are joining from online. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Apostle and uh, the leadership of the, of the church for affording me this opportunity to share with you the gospel. Amen. Amen. So as you've heard, my name is Bethia, and I am a daughter in this house. I am, I am the worship leader, and, <laughs> and I have the privilege of serving with this amazing team. So a couple of announcements before I get into the word. Apostle is away in Montreal. He is doing the work of the Lord. He's not eating poutine. He's doing the work of the Lord. And so I thank, I thank him for entrusting me this great opportunity while he does what he needs to do there. Pastor JB and Pastor Jenny are on holiday. And I wish they had taken me with them because my nerves are shot right now. But... Um, the grace of God is available to all of us. Okay, and Apostle's books are available. They'll be um, available in the foyer. There's two books that he has. He has Cryptos, Secrets, Secret Prophetic Treasures, uh, Cryptos, and he has Prophecy. A couple of, uh, probably about a month or so, we had a uh, privilege of sitting through the teachings with Apostle on Prophecy. So I encourage you to pick up the books um, from either the foyer or he also has a website online where you can go in and, and order them and, um, and enlighten yourself, get more information. Uh, and at the end of it all, we have the pot bless, which was already announced during the service, um, that we have the pot bless. So I encourage you to stick around. Uh, let's fellowship together. Let's, let's break bread. There's nothing quite like getting to the place of communion with food. You can't commune without food. Even Jesus, he broke bread. So, right. Today I'm teaching on, uh, or rather my message is on worship and the lessons of worship um, from the Samaritan woman. Uh, if, you, if we may, let's turn our Bibles or can we scroll in our books to uh, the book of John chapter 4 and we'll read from verse 1 to 24. And this is just to give us some context um, to where I'm, I'm, I'm going with it all. As Apostle shared last week, uh, worship is something that is intimate, something that requires our whole being to be thrown at the feet of him. We come in adoration to him. So we're going to read from uh, John chapter 1, John, sorry, John chapter 4 from verse 1 to 24. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of the ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to him, Will you give me, Jesus said to her, sorry, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How do you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you, he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. 
I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple of things pertaining to worship, and from the perspective of someone who's stood here on this altar to lead, to lead worship, some of the obstacles that stand in the way of true worship. And I had to define it between just worship and true worship, because there's many representations of things that appear from the outward place to be worship, but they're not worship. And this is what you see in, uh, in the scripture when, when, when she talks about the Bible. She says that our ancestors worshipped here on this mountain. She was talking about a place. There was an outward expression of worship that was not in spirit and in truth. And one of the first things that I, I've come across as, as, as someone that, that has been charged with leading worship here is one of the biggest stumbling blocks is self. You and me, we stand in the way of worship, true worship. True worship is adoration with the sole object of our worship being God. Worship is communion, worship is fellowship, worship is intimate, worship requires it all. And worship is difficult to define because it is both an attitude and an act. So we come with a condition of our hearts being, I'm going to worship, I'm going to adore you. But it's also the outward expression of lifting up our hands, of singing out, of shouting, of clapping, of jumping. All those are expressions of worship. But when she says, the Samaritan woman said, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? She was defining herself and giving herself all the reasons as to why I shouldn't engage you in this place of worship. And you and I all have the labels that we have. We all have the things that we have stood in the place and say, I cannot give you worship because of such and such a thing. I cannot give you worship. And I, I, let me just throw this out there. I cannot give you worship because I can't sing. I've, I've heard that so many times. I've been a culprit of it too, especially when your voice is raw and you're having a cold and all that and say, I can't give you worship. But the prerequisite of worship was never about a gift. It, was, it required you, a human being, the creation, to come before him and give him worship. That's what he called on. Then we say that a true worshiper will worship him in spirit and in truth. The word of God declares, let everything that has breath do what? Praise the Lord. Now, in all those things that have breath, they're not inanimate objects. They're animate objects, things that can express themselves in worship. And that's why we stand as our own stumbling block to ourselves when we begin to define ourselves and begin to give on ourselves an excuse as to why we won't engage in worship. Because I am a Jew. I can't sing. This is not my style of music. This is not my type of song. You guys are too loud. You guys are too slow. You sang the song too long. And you get in that place of, remember the object of worship is God. It's, it's, not, it's not unidirectional. It's multi, it's, it's, no, it's not multidirectional. It's unidirectional. We direct all our worship to God. That is true worship. Because there's a lot of worship that is not worship. And that's where we stand in the place of, I'm going to worship me. Now, you and I are believers. And so we know better than to say, I'm going to worship me. And we know better than to say, I'm going to worship the devil. But this is how subtle it becomes. When we begin to opt out of things because it's not my preference. It's, it's, not, it's not what I desire. This is not, this is not my, my style. 
I mean, you give yourself an excuse to opt out. Remember when Jesus came and sat at the well, he said that he was, the Bible says that he was tired and he sat at the well. But I want us to know something about his positioning there at the well. It was intentional. It was not just about, okay, this is the biggest rock here. Let me just plunk myself. He positioned himself there intentionally because it was a moment of destiny for this woman. And he wanted to bring her to that place of realization that I hold the keys to eternal life. If you would only ask of the living water from me, you would never thirst again. And so when God draws us into a place of worship, it's intentional. And not just from what he can get out of you, but because of what he's longing to pour into you. He's, he, he calls us to that place of absolute surrender. And this is, this is the reverence of worship because he gave it all. He has every right to require it all from you and me. If he had given us half of it and he asked us for all, it would be unjust. But because he spared nothing, he can come and require everything from us. And that's why worship is uncomfortable because it requires everything. It requires the abandon of self, meaning I don't like this song. I can't sing this song. I have every excuse as to why I'm not doing this and this. It requires that you surrender those things and put them on the back burner and say, it's all about you. And you throw your focus back on him. Not because all those other things are comfortable, but you've made a conscious choice to direct your worship to direct your worship to him, to always be Christ-centered, to always be Christ-focused. These moments that we can come and have the outward expressions of worship, and it seems that it's worship. Because if we judge from a human standpoint, there's a lot of things that would pass for worship. But the Bible says that he searches all things, even the spirit of man, to discern the motives so that he knows, he knows us. And that's why we come, when I say come to in a place of abandon, is to shed everything that we are. All the excuses, I'm a Jew, you're a Samaritan. That's why I can't engage with you in this place. I can't sing, it's not my style. I used to like hymns, these people sing too fast. So there's all those things. That's, that's always a conversation somewhere in the back of somebody's mind, including my own. Let me not sound like I'm pointing any fingers to anyone because I myself has, have stood in the same place where I wrestle with myself to get myself out of the way so that I can worship. The woman was distancing herself from Christ. The book of Job, in Job chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, and, and this is from the New Living Translation, when the council of heaven gathered, the members of heaven, when they gathered, they came to present themselves before the Lord. And what does it all go on to say? It says the accuser of brethren, the accuser, Satan, also came. I want us to notice something about this interaction. The members of the council of heaven, whatever it is they refer to, the council of uh, the members of heaven, meaning all the godly hosts and heavenly hosts, they came to, to the presence of God. And who also came along with them? The accuser. And this is what happens when we are engage and engaging ourselves in worship. On our way into the presence of God, that's when all the accusations come. When we are on our way into the presence of God, that's when we remember all the stuff that went wrong, that I did wrong, that all the things that should make me unworthy to come into his presence. For as long as you're sitting on your laurels, there's no accusation. But when you come into the presence of God, which is the holy of holies, which reveals our sin, that's when the devil begins to accuse and say, but you did this. How can you lift your hands? How can you? And this and that and th so many things. It's when they began to go into the presence of God that the accuser also followed along. But before that, Jesus, God asks him, where were you? Where have you been? He said, I've been roaming the earth, going to and fro. But when he saw the people are going into the presence of God, that's like, okay, I, I have, I'm on duty, let me go. There's some people I need to accuse before my heavenly father. 
This is why we contend in the place of worship. This is why we wrestle to shed ourselves. This is why we have to block and shut off our minds as we come into the presence of God. Because the mind is futile in the presence of God. But we need the revelation of God to carry us through, to propel us in worship. Worship is selfless. There's a scripture and a very short scripture in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and 10. It says, find out what pleases the Lord. And it so follows, and do it. Because if we're so enamored and so in love with this God and so grateful for all that he has done and all that he is, then it would follow that I need to know what pleases your heart so that I can do it. Find out, Ephesians 5 and 10, find out what pleases the Lord. And so when you come in worship, come with abandon, meaning it's not about self. I'm not going to give what I feel like offering. I'm going to come and ask God, what is you require? What did you require of me? What would please your heart in this moment? And you give from that place because the Father knows what he desires. And he also pours it into us so that we can pour it back out to him. In the same manner, there's, there's the weight of unforgiveness and offense and all those things that we carry on us, self. And all these things stand as an obstacle, stand as a barrier for us to just that direct access of worship to God, where we feel free just to be in his presence. But this is where I ask, I have had to ask myself this question. Is my offense much more important than what I need to offer God in this moment? Is the sickness that, you know, ha is on my body, is it way more important? Or is it way bigger than this God that I should now discount my worship and give him only what I can? There's a place of, of offense that roots us and it makes us feel justified. We are right in our, they did me wrong and you might be very well right you could be right. All the, all the evidence sides with you that they wronged you. It's true they did. But this is not the place of contending with God. I'm right. This is the place of surrender. Saying, God, you are right. It's not about them anymore. But it's about you. You are right. You are justified in drawing everything out of me. You are right in requiring worship from me. So yes, wrestle with your unforgiveness, wrestle with your offense, but leave it when you come into his presence. Leave it. It's not more important. The Bible says in the book of Romans, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Nothing in there said anything about music. Because we have a very limited view of what worship is. And we have to expand and broaden that definition in order for us to see how many ways and the variety of ways in which we can worship God. The Bible says, come let us worship and bow down. There you go. Bowing down is worship. Let us kneel, kneeling down, before the Lord our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. Come, let us worship and bow down. And a lot of those things don't even include singing. So it's not just about the voice and what we can utter with our lips. There's also the body, everything that we can do with it that also serves as worship to him. One of the issues of self in the place of worship, I know that the, I know the devil contends for our worship. I know that he longs for us to, you know, for worship to be redirected to him. But the, the bigger obstacle sometimes is, like I've said, is, is us. 
Because as a believer, if you, rec- if you recognize the devil and see him out the corner of your eye, you'll be like, ah, that's the devil, that's the devil, get away, get away. But yourself, you sneak into your own worship very subtly. And, and you, you, you stand there justified. We stand there knowing full-heartedly that this is not about me, it's about God. But we become stubborn. Say, okay, let us lift up our hands. I'm not lifting mine. Mine are heavy. I'm, I'm tired. We've been lifting them so long. And it's all, it, it always boils down to us, ourselves. The things that give me comfort in this place is what I'm, I'm going to give. If it requires much more than that, I don't want it. But the things that we need to understand about self is that we can get out of the way. The Bible says, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. So it's not a futile effort that we come and we contend with self. The Bible says in uh, John 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Meaning it's not in looking at our circumstances, the fact that I'm a Jew, the fact that I'm, I'm holding an offense, the fact that I'm holding a grudge, the fact that I've been hurt and I've been wounded in this place. It's not all those things that we need to keep our focus on. But we, keep, we lift our eyes to Christ because even if I look at this offense the whole day, it's not going to save me from it. The solution does not come from it. It's in Christ. So our hope is in Christ and our, our direction then must be shifted always to Christ and what he affords us and what he offers us so that we can worship him freely. Just as the snake was lifted up, this was the bronze serpent when, when, uh, when Moses was leading the children of Israel through the, through the desert and the poisonous snakes were, were unleashed and they were bitten by them. And God commanded him to build a bronze serpent, serpent and to put it up on a cross and say, if anyone is bitten, they shall look up to the cross, they shall look up to the bronze serpent and they shall be healed. And that was a foreshadowing of what Christ was doing for, would do for us on the cross. That as we look up at the place we have been wounded, at the place we have been afflicted, as we look up to him, healing flows so that we can be whole in his presence. And we can offer him the praise that is due to him. Amen. Humble yourself, therefore, before the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. So how do you train yourself? How do you get out of your own way in the place of self? You teach yourself. You train yourself. Because I've come to find out if I say, if I'm going to try, I'm, I'm going to try something, chances are I will make an effort, but if it doesn't work, I'm walking away. That's at least I've, I've tried. I can conscientiously say I've tried. But there's something different about training. When you say, I'm going to train myself. Training means that I'm going to try probably a couple times. It's probably going to fail. It's not going to look as good, but I'll keep at it until it comes out looking right. That's what training is. You train yourself. You train yourself in that place of worship where you resist all the accusations and focus instead of on all that's been thrown at you, but on him. So you train yourself in a place of worship. You train yourself to, to know the truth of God. You teach your heart the truth. You sing, your heart, you sing the truth of who he is. You speak, you declare the truth of who he is. This is how you train yourself to get out of the way. Psalm 73, uh, Psalm 73 uh, says, But as for me, this is uh, a Psalm of Asaph. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my footing. In verse 16 to 19, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Now you got to, I've skipped a number of verses in there, but this is a man lamenting that all this stuff is going on. Look at the wicked, how they prosper. And he's, he is, he's pouring out his guts because it seems like the wicked are doing so much more better than him. And it's like, is all my work and all my reserving myself and, and training myself, is it all futile? And he says, uh, oh, when, it's, when I tried to understand all this, it deeply troubled me. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood the final destiny. 
Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they're destroyed and completely swept away by terrors. And Psalm 73, 24 to 26, you guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will give me, in, you will take me into your glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God, you're the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You command your heart. You command your heart. You remind your heart that everything that I desire is in Christ. And afterwards, he will take me into this glory. The, other, the, other, the, uh, the next obstacle that I want to talk about is a lack of revelation or a lack of understanding. There is, our worship is informed by what we know. Because I can say, God is healer. But if I don't know him as healer, there's a certain limitation to what I'm saying. Meaning that I, I can't fully execute it with authority. I can't firmly pass it and say, take it to the bank and say, yeah, cash this. He's healer. He's going to heal. I, I'm, I'm reminded of the story of, um, and this is an anecdote. I think Apostle has shared this um, as well here in the pulpit. So there is, um, there's a story of a man who was traveling by plane. And he happened to be sitting next to a young, a young child, a young girl. Uh, and the plane happened to hit turbulence. And the girl was very calm all through. And at the end of it all, he asked her, so why were you so calm in the, in the turbulence? You were, not, you were not afraid. And she says to him, that's because my father is a pilot and he's taking me home. Um, there's that. There's, there's the knowledge that we have of God as father. And, and we get intimately acquainted with that, meaning that we've, we've trained, like I've said in, in the first one, you've trained yourself and you've come to know him and you've come to experience him in all these wonderful ways, which is the revelation. But it's not, in the case of this man and, this, and, the, and the child, it's not the knowledge of what the child knew that would give the man comfort. So I can tell you, it's okay, my dad is the pilot. But I don't know if your dad is a psycho. I don't know if he wants to crash this plane. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is the girl knows, and so she can sit securely in that knowledge that my dad is a pilot and he's taking us home. She can sit securely in that because she's fully assured, fully persuaded that my dad knows what he's doing. But for the man on the other side, okay, that's great but there's still a limited understanding because I'm not intimately acquainted with your dad to know that he's not the psycho who's going to crash us into the mountains. And so in this place, we have to come to the place of our own revelation, our own intimate walk with God, our own interaction with him in that place. Because it's okay for me to come and tell you, God is healer. Or it's okay for me to tell you, God is awesome, God is powerful. But until you know it for yourself, then you can come with full conviction and say, and, sir, and render your worship. This is what informs our worship, revelation, knowledge, understanding. But for as long as you don't know and you're relying on what is said to you by someone else, it's a third party account that you know nothing of. It's he said, she said. And what if God fails you in that moment? You said God will heal and he doesn't heal you. What do you go back to them and say, God didn't heal me. You said he will heal me. You know it for yourself. That's what informs you. That what, that's what gives you authority. That's what gives you full conviction to stand on it and be stubborn in that knowledge. Because God, you said it. You said it and that's who you are. We have to train ourselves to get, to, to get past all the noise of everything. We have to train ourselves not to be lazy. Say, I'm going to wait for the pastor to preach. I'm going to wait to hear it from somebody else. Because the discomfort yet again is that it costs you something to go and seek it for yourself. It's easy for me to come and say, Pastor Carl, pray for me. I'm going through something. Pray for me. But I've, I've passed on the baton to him. Now he's the one busy praying. Me, I can go and eat. 
And that's where we become lazy in our own walk. Because we entrust somebody else with our own destiny. I, I want to know God for myself. But I'm too, I don't want to spend that much time reading the word. Or I don't want to spend that much time in prayer. Because when I open my Bible, I feel sleepy. True. I'm just going to put it out there, including myself. When I, when I open the Bible, I feel sleepy. Or when I begin to pray, that's when the phone is ringing. Or that's when I remember, oh man, I had, this text has been sitting in my inbox for five days. I need to respond. For those of you who have been um, exposed to my delayed responses on text. But somehow it's in those moments where we're, we're trying to focus in on God that there's all these other things pulling, pulling from us. But we train ourselves in that place. Say, okay, it's good for me to hear from somebody else. But I want to know it for myself. So pay the price. Pay the price. And the, the amazing thing about paying the price is that the, the, the reward is already built in. The Bible says, God said to Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. Meaning even the reward of our worship, the reward of our seeking is God. And everything that comes along with him. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. All those things that come along with God. It's in our seeking. It's in our contending. It's in our pressing in. He will not deny. The word of God says, for those that diligently seek him will find. So it's, it's, not, it's not the blind leading the blind. And he's not a puzzle that we need to unravel and say, God, you, I, I came around this corner and then you hid yourself. He's, he wants to be discovered. And he's longing, he's longing to pour into us and reveal himself to us freely. Freely. Uh, the last thing that I want to touch on... Um, Yes, the last obstacle that I wanted to touch on is traditions. Traditions, and I'll put this together all in the same um, one, is a lack of wonder. The woman said to Jesus, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. We've been used to doing things a certain way. Our, our ancestors worshipped here. So we'll keep worshiping here. And there's no, um, there's no desire to go outside of that to allow, even to inquire of God. What, what do you desire of me? What is it that, what would please you in this moment? And Jesus responds to how it's amazing and say, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will neither worship the Father on this mountain nor in, the, in Jerusalem. Meaning that it was not about the place that she, was, she kept pointing to. Because it was a place where rituals were executed, but rituals of worship. And that's why I had to make the distinction between true worship and just worship. Because we can all worship, but where the object is not Christ, is not God, then it's not true worship. And in this place, she said... This is where our ancestors worshipped. And, and, and Jesus was trying to pull her away from that and say, it's not, it's not going to matter at some point. Because the time is coming and is now. And, he, and in, in Christ drawing her to that place, first and foremost, you have to ask, I, asked, I asked myself this question. Why did Jesus say to her, um, when, she, when she asked him, give me this water, Jesus said to her, go bring your husband. What's that got to do with anything? Just give me the water or not. What has that got to do with anything? But he was drawing her into a place where she would realize his need for him. It was not really about the husband. Because when did, when did Jesus know her story? When? He knew it all along even when he went to sat at the well. He knew who she was. He knew, and that's why he engaged her in worship, but in, in conversation, but he drew her in. And she, with her own mouth, said, I don't have a husband. It was to swat him off, just, just to say, leave that alone. And she deflects the conversation to say, our, worship, our, our ancestors worshipped on this temple. It was to say, don't keep pressing down that line. This is not a pretty place. Don't keep, don't keep pursuing down that line. 
It's, I'm not really proud of that stuff. And then she deflects it now to say, okay, but our ancestors worshipped here. Meaning to, to, to show that there's some things that we, we want to just leave in the, we don't want to address them in the presence of God. We want to leave them and say, God, don't touch that. Don't ask me about that. Don't touch that. But you're saying, like, yeah, I know you want to deflect it and say, yeah, don't touch it. But then you want to come and jump like crazy and worship. But he's, he wants to heal that. That. And he said, historically, our ancestors worshipped here. Meaning to say that if I was going to pass on any um, manual of how to worship, I would probably tell my kids to do the same thing. Come here to this mountain. If you worship at any other mountain, that's not, that's not worship. But you restrict, she restricted herself just to a place. And that's why Christ had to tell her that the true worshiper will worship in spirit and in truth. Because that does not require a place. The Bible says that you and I are temples of the Holy Spirit. So that means that wherever we are, we as, we, we as his creation, we can offer our praise and worship and adoration to him at any place, at any time. And no one needs to interject into it because it can be in our mind, it can be, it can be expressed, it can be in our actions, it can be in our doing. But we need to challenge the traditions. We need to challenge the things that we've done, we've consistently done this this way. Okay. I only sing hymns in my church. I grew up singing hymns. No, this is not worship then because they're singing other stuff. But you're so used to doing something a certain way, but that doesn't make it right. We have to ask the question because every single moment you have to inquire of God. This is what David did. He inquired of the Lord and that's what it says in Ephesians 5. Find out what pleases the Lord. Because at one instant in the, historic, in the history of the church, it was all hymns. And that's fine. But we've, we also, we've progressed, the styles of music have progressed and all that. And all these things can and do please God. So don't get stuck in the past of how things were done. But come and ask daily. Daily, how can I please you? Find out what pleases the Lord. You cannot say that, yes, I was ordained a true worshiper in 1963, ever since I've been a true worshiper. <laughs> you know why? Because you have to continually keep asking. You have to keep rediscovering. You have to come to that place of absolute wonder. And this is where I, I, I struggle sometimes because we, we become so used to the routine of things. We, we get so used to it. I'm going to sing three slow songs. And then I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to jump in there with three fast songs. In between, I'm going to say a couple of words. And that's just in, in, just in, that's in the course of our service. I'm using that as an example. But you get used to the routine of things. And you lose the wonder of what it is that you're, who is it that you're worshiping? There's a song that I like from, um, from Bethel. And it talks about, may we never lose our wonder. Wide-eyed, mystified. May we be like a child staring at the beauty of our king. This is why Jesus said, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Because there's, there's, a, there's a curiosity that comes with children. And it's almost like each time they see you anew, it's they're seeing you for the first time again. I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm your mother. I, I gave birth to you like each time. But when you open the door and you say, hi, baby, it's like the first time they're seeing you. There's that renewed way that they look at life. You can spank this child. <laughs> As I, you know, I was often spanked. You can spank it. But even when I'm crying, I'll go back to the same one who spanked me. And this, this, this is the wonder of children. It's like their, their memory is short-lived. And that's, that's that when he said the kingdom of God belongs to such as these, it's because we, we have to stay in that place of wonder where we don't just get so used to, ah, it's Easter. I'm going to see pictures of the cross. He was crucified. He was gory. And 
We have to play, stay in the place of wonder where we remember not just the horrors of the cross, but what it accomplished for us. You have to find the position or posture yourself in a place of worship, in a place of wonder. Where whatever he did is revealed afresh to you. Each moment. God, you did it. God, you healed. But the thing is that he, never, he didn't stop doing he conti- and he's continued to do. Meaning we have every reason. We have all the reasons to keep renewing our knowledge of him. To keep renewing our revelations of him. Because if all he did was die on the cross and that's it, then we could leave it as that. But he's kept doing things for you and me up until this day. And even into the future. He keeps doing. And so we have to stay in that place of wonder. I want to close with a story of uh, one of uh, uh, a Christian singer. His name is Matt Redman. How many, how many of you have had the song Heart of Worship? The Heart of Worship? I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Matt Redman, in sharing the story of this song, said, You've probably heard this story. There was a special time in the life of our church when it felt like God was highlighting something to us about worship, about what worship is and what worship isn't. We'd had some amazing times and encounters with God and threw ourselves into it. But recently, in this little season, we had lost something of that dynamic and it became a bit of a spectator sport. So Pastor Mike did a brave thing, he said, We're not going to have a sound system for a while. No instruments, no lead worshipers, nothing. We're going to get in a room with our voices and our hearts and just check where we're at. And at the point, and at the point, and the point was just to strip away everything and find out where to go. And if you come through the doors of the church on Sunday morning, What are you bringing to the offering? It was a painful time at first. But slowly and surely we began to rediscover what it meant to bring an offering to God. I wrote Hurt of Worship to describe the time when the music fades and all is stripped away. And I simply come longing just to bring Something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. Before long, we brought back the band and the sound system, but something had changed in our hearts. As the chorus says, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team up so we can spend a couple of moments in worship. Where we can just experience him in all that he is. Withholding nothing, where it's not about the music, it's not about how loud it is, it's not about what language they sing in, which can be an uh, an obstacle for us too, but where we're just saying, God, what pleases you? That's it. What pleases you? Because that's what I'm here to deliver on. That's what I'm here to deliver on today. So I want to invite us to stand on our feet as we spend a couple of moments in worship. And maybe we can start from that one. It's all about you. Uh, 
I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Mm. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart let's sing it all together i'm coming back
Call 